Welcome to Gas Station Business 101 podcast. I'm your host Shabir Hussain and this is episode number 15. Welcome to the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast, where you can learn all the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money. This podcast is brought to you by the good folks at CSB Academy Publishing Company. And now, here is your host, Shabir Hossein. Welcome to Gas Station Business 101 podcast. This is episode number 15, and in today's episode, I want to bring everybody's focus on the biggest bulk of our business, which is gasoline or fuel. If you're in gas station business, then you already know that more than 50% of our revenue comes from selling fuel. But I know we have not talked about it at all in last 14 episodes. It's kind of like the big elephant. We all know it's in the room. We just didn't want to talk about it, but that's not the case. Today's the episode that we will address everything under the sun about fuel, about gasoline, and how to deal, how to price, how to buy, and everything else. Now, fuel or gasoline part of your business has many moving parts. And even being in the business for many years, some of us still do not have a clear understanding of what rack price is or what jobber markup is and what and how crude oil pricing affect us either negatively or positively. And then what pool margin is all about. So what I've decided is today we're going to touch on these very important five elements that I just mentioned and how they play a huge role in figuring out at what price we should sell our fuel and once we sell it, how much money did we make? So today, I want to clarify and simplify all of those components of fuel and everything that is associated with this part of our business. On a broader look, it is essentially the same as any other business. You buy the product, in this case fuel, at a wholesale cost, then sell them at a retail cost where you get to keep your profit margin like you do on cigarettes, soda, or candy bars. But when dealing with fuel, It is not that simple. When you buy a case of 20 ounce Coke, for example, you can look at the invoice that you get from Coca-Cola and figure out, okay, I paid $1.05 for each bottle, so I should sell them at $1.49. Again, I'm not giving you a realistic example. Uh, It may cost you more or less, but just for for the sake of uh, giving an example, let's assume uh, you pay $1.05 for each bottle of Coke and you sold them at $1.49, and you made 29% gross profit, right? Well, when it comes to fuel, how do you know what you're actually paying? You may say, you get the price notification from your jobber or supplier every day. That's fine, but are you paying that price that they say that that is the rack price today? I think you need to look very closely. The day you get your fuel, sit down with that invoice and see what else is being added to that rack price cost that you get through email or text message or fax every day. You'll be surprised you're not paying that rack price. Well, they're charging you the rack price. I'm, I'm not saying they're not, but there are other things they're adding on to that cost. And again, they're not doing anything illegal. It's the cost that comes with delivering fuel So there are a lot of moving costs in this fuel invoice that I'm talking about. So once you sit down with it and you break it down, you will get to see what I'm talking about. But more importantly, you need to look into your contract that you have with your supplier or with your jobber. That will tell you how much they're adding onto the fuel that you get every day. They will tell you how much the jobber markup is, but but it's not only jobber markup that we need to talk about. Let us let me go through the list so you'll understand. As I said, whatever rack price you get every day, well, you're paying that price. That is for sure. But there are other added costs to your fuel. What 
we need to talk about first is the five points that you need to verify and you need to go through so you can understand what is being charged and how. Number one, a dealer jobber agreement. Very important. I want you to pull out your agreement. I'm sure you have one. We all have one. And in that agreement, your jobber told you how many days of credit you're supposed to get, what type of pricing you should get. A lot of times the jobber mentions that they will sell you fuel at penny over rack. It's a common term, penny over rack. means whatever rack price they sent you, they will add a penny to that rack price. Why? Because, well, they're in business, so they need to make money. And they cannot just add five cents today, three cents tomorrow, because fuel is a very competitive product. So they are being upfront. They tell you how much they will add. And generally speaking, if you have a standard jobber contract, it will say penny over rack. There are times I've seen as high as five pennies over rack. And in those are cases, extreme cases, where jobber has invested quite a bit of money to upgrade a facility or they installed uh, dispensers or upgraded tanks. So they have cost associated with that station. And the way they can get their money back or investment back is by charging more per gallon. Instead, let's say the dealer uh, didn't have money to upgrade the station so the jobber invest money into that station and they have the dealer sign a contract saying okay for next seven years or until the loan is paid off i will be paying five cents or four cents above rack price to pay off that loan that is a different case but in in a normal scenario you should be paying either penny over rack and there are times i've seen no penny added to the rack price because the jobber has other incentives from the oil company, uh, let's say Exxon, Chevron, or anybody else. They have a incentive that they get from the oil company and they usually say, okay, you know, I'll be happy with that incentive. So I will sell you fuel just at a rack price. I will not add a penny. You, If you're lucky, you will have that deal. But s- some of us are not that lucky. Now, Moving on to number two, fuel carrying cost. Very important, you know, how much you're paying for for a carrier to bring your fuel to your station. This is one of those costs that is not set in stone, so it can vary widely. And it is important to look at every invoice you get and make sure you see how much your carrying cost is. For example, you get fuel from, let's say, terminal 15 miles from your station every week all of a sudden the terminal has a shutdown so they have to bring fuel from another terminal which is 50 miles away your carrying cost goes up pretty much doubles so it is important to check that in every invoice that way you'll figure out exact cost of your fuel as i said it varies widely number three demerage fees what is demerage fees it is where the driver let's say the carrier the driver goes to the terminal and there is a delay. Oftentimes you will hear the terminal has a delay. There are lots of reasons for them uh, having delays, but let's say they had a shutdown and they just coming back up and 20 trucks in line to get fuel. And it usually takes 30, 40 minutes for a truck to get fueled up with eight, 9,000 gallons. So in that event, your driver may be waiting at the terminal for two to three hours. And every hour they wait, you pay for it. So in some of the invoices that you get you may see a damage fee of let's say they may charge you 70 80 90 up, upwards 100 110 dollars an hour for the truck to sit at the terminal waiting to be loaded in that event again your cost per gallon because you have to factor that into each gallon and that way you can get your accurate fuel cost but in this event if let's say he waited three hours to get fueled up and in that three hours they charged you hundred dollars an hour so again you just paid 300 extra dollars for eight thousand gallons of fuel so you have to factor that three hundred dollars into your fuel cost and obviously your fuel cost will be higher in this load number four fuel surcharged imposed by your carrier not your jobber it's not imposed by the jobber it is the carrier And only time you will see this uh, when 
the diesel price because every truck that brings you the fuel is it runs on diesel fuel let's say they set up in standard or not in standard a set marker so to speak where they say anytime the diesel fuel costs more than let's say i'm just picking a number here two dollars and 75 cents a gallon uh, we will charge you a fuel surcharge fee that means let's say when the diesel is at two dollars a gallon uh, the truck burns 15 gallons to bring you the load to your station. All of a sudden, when the diesel costs $3, it's costing them pretty much uh, 50% more or 25% more, depending on how much the diesel price is. But what they did essentially is they set a mark. They said, anytime it goes above certain pricing, we will charge you a fuel surcharge fee. So, for example, there are invoices. If you are in this business for a while, go back to about two years back and, and you will see that there are fuel surcharges quite high because gasoline price and diesel price was at a peak in back in 2012, 2013 range. Uh, now that it has come down, you may not see that charge again. But once it starts going back up, the fuel prices you will see that charge coming back onto your invoice. So keep an eye out for that. And last but not the least is credit card fees. Some of you may do accounting differently, but the way I calculate my cost of fuel is adding credit card fees on top of my fuel cost. The reason being, I've noticed 75% of our customer buy gasoline with credit cards. Most of them do pay at the pump. Other people come inside and pay it, and a lot of times it will be with credit cards. As you know, cash is declining. It's slow but steady, but it is declining, and more and more people are using Visa check card, debit card, your American Express, uh, Discover, whatever it is, there is a charge to accept that card. Let's say out of 100 people that charge credit card at your facility, 70 of those cards will be just standard Visa Master debit card. But the other 30% will be Fleet Card or Discover or American Express. And again, there is a charge to accept those cards, as I said. And generally speaking, if you have a branded station, you're paying roughly about 1.75 to 1.85% to accept cards, the Visa Master. But whenever you accept American Express or any fleet card or Discover, they charge higher rate to accept cards. So let's say American Express can charge as high as 3.75% and Discover, I think, is about 3.5%. I could be wrong on that. But again, they're higher. My point is Discover and some of the fleet cards, even Fuel Man, uh, even though they calculate their pricing differently, but we will touch on that in another topic, another subject for another day. But any other card other than Visa Master will charge you higher fees. So it is best to assume you're going to be paying 2% more to accept cards from your customer. So for example, if you have taken, if you have sold one gallon of gasoline at $2, your price, your selling price is $2 a gallon at the pump. And you sold some individual one gallon and they charged their credit card, let's say Visa or MasterCard. How much extra are you paying to accept that card? So it is 2% would be two pennies per dollar. So if your gasoline is at $2, you're paying the credit card company four cents to sell that one gallon of fuel. So in this event, you really, let's say you're margin was 10 cents once you take the credit card fees out it's six cents it is down so i generally calculate my credit card fees right inside my fuel cost that way i know exactly how much i'm making now let's talk about five important elements of fuel like i said at the beginning and these are the elements that affect our fuel pricing and profitability deeply we all hear these terms, but some of us are still confused as to what they all mean and stand for. So here they are. Number one, crude oil prices. We all know crude is a commodity and we all hear it on TV, on financial news that the crude 
price is rising or it's falling. And as I said, it is a commodity. It, it gets traded daily on New York Mercantile Exchange, not Stock Exchange, but Mercantile Exchange, with the rest of the other commodities like you know, heating oil and soybean. Uh, that's where the commodities get traded. And now, we, why do we need to know this? Bear with me and I'll tell you. Crude is what we get from either going deep under the sea or under the ground. We all know that Middle East has a lot of oil. Where? Under the ground. And then we all know Gulf, of sea, Gulf sea has a lot of oil. How? Under the water, under the sea. And now there are two kinds of crude. One is light, sweet crude, and the other one is the regular crude. Now, light, sweet crude is what we get usually from Middle East. And sometimes nowadays we get it from Gulf as well. And the difference between the two is light, sweet crude is easier to process at the refinery. That means it takes less refinery work to make it into gasoline. And the other type goes through much more rigorous process. So it costs more to process that crude and turn that into fuel. And it is important for us to know why? Because crude oil prices affect us directly. Our rack price is directly related to crude prices. Now, if the crude costs more to process, they will charge us more. Means the rack price will be higher. But one important thing in this note that I want to mention, we all need to monitor crude prices. I know if you're into gas station business, you most likely monitor the rack price every day, and that is fine. But it is more important for you to monitor crude prices. And this is why, if let's say the crude price has increased, has gone up today by $5 a barrel, then your fuel price or your rack price will most likely go up either tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So there is a 36 to 48 hour delay. Similarly, when crude price goes down, your fuel price do not go down right away. It takes, again, two, one to two days, sometimes three. If you are monitoring that, and let's say you notice today that the crude price just went up $7 or $10, and you know you have room in your tank that you can buy gasoline and store, it is a good idea to go ahead and order and get a load into your tank in this lower price because you still if you order today and get it tomorrow hopefully the price hasn't gone up tomorrow and it will go up the next day then you gain that advantage and in this business anytime you can gain an advantage of five to seven to eight cents or even two to three pennies for that matter it is a huge gain we all need to monitor crude prices and the best way you can monitor that if you have a smartphone just download an app and there are plenty of apps in your app store. Just look for crude oil pricing. And you may find an app that tracks not only crude oil, but gold and other precious metal. But just monitor crude prices that way and you will be well informed and you can make decisions smartly ahead of time. Number two, rack price. And again, we hear this word all day long, rack price. And most of us know what it is, which is, the price that we get in our fax or through our email and text messages. But it is, again, essentially the wholesale price that varies day to day and relies on the traded price of the crude, like I said, in a broader way. So if the crude goes up today, you may see your wholesale rack price will rise the next day or the day after. Mostly because simple rule of supply and demand. But have you ever questioned who sets the rack price? I know, as I said, the crude pretty much figures that out, if it should go up or down. But how do you know exactly what price to set for the rack for today? Well, it is usually done by the refineries because the way it works is refineries get the crude either from Middle East or from Gulf or wherever they get it from. And every refinery, and in an area, there is there is usually uh, typically one refinery to an area because there are only a couple of hundred refineries in the whole country. So let's say in your area there is one refinery 
and they get their crude in. And once they process it, remember I mentioned earlier that if it's a light sweet crude, it will take less process, processing power. So that means it may cost a little bit cheaper as far as the refinery is concerned. Now, if the crude price was higher and a refinery still will charge you a higher rack price because they bought it at a higher cost. But as far as the refinery cost goes, it may be a little bit lower. So what they do is they buy barrels of this crude. And now one thing to mention, one barrel means 40, one barrel has 42 gallons of fuel. So once they get this crude in, they process that and they factor in their cost into each gallon they produce. And then they say, okay, today I will be selling unbranded regular at X amount of dollar and premium at X amount of dollar and diesel fuel at the X amount of dollars. So rack price is set by the refineries. Now, let's say you have a friend in Ohio and you're in California and you both run Exxon branded fuel station. Your rack price may be different than his rack price. Even though you are both in same branded gas stations, it's because the refinery that they're getting it from could post a higher price or a lower price depending on their situation and where they're getting the crude in and how much processing they're doing. So just because you run an Exxon branded, branded station uh, in one city doesn't mean the other city will be paying exactly same rack price. Number three on that list is jobber markup. Jobber markup is something I just explained when I spoke about dealer jobber agreement. Again, I will just touch on it. A wholesaler or a jobber typically buys their fuel from the refinery at the rack price. They're not adding anything extra profit like the refineries are adding their cost and profit and then they're setting the rack price. But when jobber turns around and sells that same fuel to you, they're not adding a markup on top of that. When I say they're not adding markup, let me clarify. They're not giving you a different set of pricing and say, this is your price today. They're essentially passing the rack price that they get from the refineries to you, but they also are adding a penny, two pennies, three pennies, four pennies, depending on that contract you have with them. So when you get your gas invoice, you will see that they are still charging you the rack price and then they're adding their profit and whatever you agreed with them, that's what they will add on to the cost. So they're not doing anything illegal, but whatever agreement you have, that's what they will charge. Number three, net cost. Net cost is the cost that once you get your rack price and if you have a delivery of fuel today, then all the other associated costs, you add all of them with your rack price, then you arrive to your net cost. And the reason it is important because there is no set formula that you can use every day. It changes every day. So every time you get a gas load in, you need to add all of those and then you get your net cost. Now, what will you need to add to figure this cost out? Let's go through them. First, you have your rack price. Okay. Then let's say you have gasoline delivered to your store today. So there is a delivery cost. Like I said, remember the first five things I mentioned where you have a fuel carrying cost. So let's say you received rack price of $2 today. Then the jobber markup is a penny. So it's 201. Then your carrying cost. Let's say the carrying cost is two cents per gallon. It, it can be two to three to four cents a gallon, but let's assume it's two pennies a gallon. So right now you're at 203. Then if the driver had to wait in the terminal, then they charged you a demerge fee. Let's say another three cents. So it is 202 plus three, it's 205 right now. Then let's say there are fuel surcharge of a penny. It's 206 now. Then you add all your taxes. You will see on your gas invoice, there are all kinds of taxes in there from federal, state, local to city. So it varies where you are. Depending on your location, your tax will vary. So the location I'm in, our tax is right at 40 cents. So let's add 40 cents to that 206, which would be 
246. So my cost today should be 246. And then last thing I need to add is my credit card fees. And let's say per gallon, I will be paying 4 cents. So that's 250. So my net cost today is 250. Now, some of you may disagree and say, I do not want to add credit card on top of this. And that is fine. That is, if that is how you do your bookkeeping, you add that cost at a separate location or in separately and factor that in some other way, that is fine. So as, but what I, my point being, you need to know exactly how much your fuel is costing you. That way, when you sell every gallon, you will know exactly how much you're making. So net cost is a very important cost to know. And that way you can calculate your profit every day. Number five is pool margin. I'm sure if you're in gas business, you've heard this term many, many times. And some of you already know what it is. I will clarify this just for those who may be confused as to what pool margin is all about. In simple terms, pool margin is the combined profit you make after deducting all the expenses. So remember we just spoke about net cost and your pool margin essentially should be whatever your selling price is minus your net cost is your profit. Sounds simple, right? But in reality, it is not. See, the issue is we sell three or four, four grades of fuel in our store. And I'm sure you do too. And they all cost differently. So the profit margin is different. Let's say you have regular unleaded, plus unleaded, and premium unleaded. Most of us have those three grades and some of us have diesel fuel. Your pool margin can be calculated on each grade separately or a combination. Well, keep the diesel out because it's completely a different type of pricing structure and tax structure. So when you're calculating pool margin, it is better to calculate pool margin for your gasoline part and then diesel separately. Now, why would it be so confusing to figure out pool margin? Let's say if somebody says, I have 10 cents average pool margin, that means they're saying that combining all three grades, they're making 10 cents a gallon. That also will mean that they're making less on regular and more on premium. I'm sure you have noticed that our mid-grade and premium, we sell it at a little bit higher cost. Of course, we pay more to buy those, but we sell it at a higher profit margin. So our profit margin, since the profit margin is higher on those two grades and lower on regular, our average profit margin is in the middle between those two. One is the high side, one is the low side. So when you average those, it becomes closer to the middle, but not all the way to the middle because you sell mostly regular and not premium. Let's clarify that. Say you bought 8,000 gallons of regular fuel today, and after adding all the cost, you found each gallon cost you $2. You then survey your area, because that's how we price ourselves. We search and see what else other people are pricing their fuel at, and see that other retailers posting at, uh, let's say, $2.11 to $2.15. And you decide to price yourself right at $2.12. Now, if you added all the costs that we talked about, including credit card fees, then your profit right now is 12 cents a gallon, and that is your net profit on regular fuel. Now, you can calculate every grade separately as far as your pool margin goes, but you will have a problem calculating the mid-grade. If you have all three grades, chances are you only get two types of gasoline delivered to your store. One is regular unleaded, and one is premium unleaded. Most of us do not get mid-grade delivered to our store anymore. Reason being, 15, 16 years ago, the technology has improved somewhat where the dispensers that we have in our stores nowadays have a blender built into it, meaning mid-grade is essentially is a blend of premium and regular. That's how we get to grade 89 in most of the states. And the way it works is, they mix 70% regular fuel with 30% premium fuel and makes it grade 89 or mid-grade. So we, most of us, buy regular and premium and mix those up and make the mid-grade. So now, since you didn't buy mid-grade, it would be hard for you to calculate the cost of it. Now, you can use a formula on Excel. 
uh, which I have done many years ago. I created a formula on Excel. So anytime we sold mid-grade, that would automatically take 70% off a of regular and 30% off of premium and figure out the cost. You can use it that way or use your calculator every day to figure out how much really it cost you versus how much you sold and figure out a pool margin. And then once you figure out the pool margin for the mid-grade, you do for premium also because premium should be easy because you bought premium. So you know exact cost of that. And then if you have diesel, similarly, you do that as well. And then you can average all three grades and figure out an average pool margin or do like I do. I just figure out my regular because I know I'm making more on plus and premium. So I only focus on regular because 70 to 80% of our fuel sales, depending on the station, is usually regular gasoline. So my main focus is on regular. As long as I'm making 7, 8, 9, 10 cents on regular gasoline, I know I'll be able to meet my cost because there is a cost of doing business and I need to get that cost from selling fuel and other groceries and whatnot. So we all have a budget that, you know, we have to have certain amount of money uh, generated, income generated from selling fuel. I know we don't meet that expectation every month, but it is nice to meet or exceed that. So that's why I only focus on regular. Even though I calculate the other two, and it is always nice to know you're making 20 cents or 25 cents on premium brand, I mean, premium fuel or diesel fuel. But regular is what can take our business to the ground if you're not making any money. Especially, let's say you bought fuel at $2 a gallon and your competitors, you noticed, bought two days ago and their cost was lower two days ago. So they're selling at one ninety-five. Now, you bought it at $2. How can you sell it for $1.95? Can you take five cents loss a gallon? Well, sometimes we all do some of these things, even though it costs us money. And at the end of the day, it is not a good idea. We're not in business to lose money, but we all do that sometimes because gas business is a very tricky business. But let's hope we don't have to go that route. And if you, again, keep an eye on the crude prices, there are times you can forecast and buy smartly and don't have to see losing money this way. Now, a couple of things to remember, as I mentioned, one is how mid-grade is made. Like I said, 70-30 ratio. So just keep, just rem remember that. And when you calculate, uh, you have to take that ratio into consideration. Next to keep in mind is diesel fuel. What are you going to remember about diesel fuel? It's taxed differently, like I mentioned earlier. Let's say you're, for example, in, in our city, we pay 40 cents for fuel tax. Now, diesel should, um, I believe diesel is taxed at 52 cents. So any city you go to, there is a difference of taxation between fuel and diesel. So you need to keep that in mind when factoring in your cost versus how much you're selling it for and what your pool margin is on, on diesel. So in case you did not know there is a higher tax, you would be calculating with fuel tax and you may lose money because most oftentimes, most of the cities will charge you 10, 12 cents, 15 cents higher for diesel fuel. So if you do not factor that in, your profit is down the drain. So keep an eye out for that. Another important factor I need to mention, that is a typical fuel carrying truck holds about 8,500 gallons of fuel. And it usually has three compartments. Some of them have four, but typical carrying a uh, fuel carrying truck has three compartments so they can carry three grades of gasoline or diesel when you order fuel your carrier charges you for the whole load of fuel which is 8500 gallons their truck load is 8500 gallons so let's say you ordered 8500 gallons and the delivery cost was 175 dollars so in this event you paid two cents a gallon to have that fuel delivered to your station but what if you only bought 6,000 gallons and not 8,500 gallons? What happens then? Well, in this event, they will still charge you $175. That means your fuel cost would jump by another penny. Means you're paying three cents a gallon now to get that fuel into your station. So you see, whenever you buy split load, means you bought less than a truck load, 
you're still paying for the full truckload to bring them uh, to bring the fuel to your station that means each gallon will cost you higher than compared to if you would have bought a full load so that is another thing you need to understand and remember always to order if you can a truckload that way it's cheaper for you to bring that gas into the station and sell it at a cheaper price the last point to remember or understand is gross gallon versus net gallon take a look at your bill of lading the piece of paper that the truck driver drops off at your station right after they deliver the fuel it's called bill of lading and you will see both of this where it says gross gallon would may say 8500 gallons and net gallon 8300 something or 8400 something have you ever wondered why and you may also notice summer time the difference is bigger and winter times it's lower well it is because fuel or gasoline is being measured a different way well gallon is measured is by the volume and not by weight so it's liquid we measure liquid by how much place i mean how much surface it covers in a measured way then instead of how much it weighs so one gallon of gasoline may weigh 4 5 pounds but we're not weighing it in that way we're selling it by the volume so if it's really hot outside means let's say 100 degree temperature the volume tend to rise and that way your net versus gross will have a more bigger difference and when the temperature is cooler that means the volume is lower and thus the difference would be lower now don't worry you get billed on the net gallons and not on the gross so that is a comfort to know that we're being billed for the net gallons just to recap the five elements of fuel pricing that play the key role in factoring how and what our fuel price is and how much we should sell it for and how much money do we actually make out of selling this fuel number 1 is crude oil prices and remember i said keep an eye on it that way you can forecast things better number 2 rack price number 3 jobber markup number 4 is net cost and number 5 is pool margin like i said i have an excel sheet that i created a long time ago that i used to calculate the mid grade any of you think you need that let me know by sending me an email and i will forward that to you the best way to get in touch with me is by simply going to my site gasstationbusiness101.com and go to the newsletter subscription you, on the very front page you will see on the top and at the bottom where it says subscribe and once you subscribe you get an email that is confirming your subscription just hit reply and say i want that excel sheet and i will forward that to you in previous episodes i mentioned that i'm still working on and finalizing on some of the operational checklists that you can use in your business every day and get benefit from it well i'm still working on it and i'm almost finished up with couple of them and i'm still working on some more but what in the meantime what i want you to do is go to my site and sign up so once i'm done i will send you some of these cheat sheets and checklist that you can use every day and trust me you will benefit from using that and your employees can use that and you can track their progress now time to answer some email the first one came from ron and he asked about the cash register to video interface that i mentioned in episode where i spoke about theft control i believe that was episode 10 i could be wrong and he wanted to know where to buy and install them how to install them and where to buy them well ron um the way i got mine was through my vendor that services my cash registers and dispensers i'm sure in your city you have many companies at least 3 4 of those companies they're full service companies they do from gas station building to pump maintenance to register maintenance and the, most of them are authorized agent of gil barco ruby verifone and passport and all of that so if you 
I'm not sure what register you have. Mine is a Ruby Sapphire. And what you need to do is contact your vendor, your local vendor, and ask them to order you one of those cables, interface cables. And they're the one who can hook it up because what I understand is they have to open a port on back of your register to let the register allow for that data to go out of the register. So they have to open a port and they have to authorize somewhere inside that program where that data travels from your register to your DVR and you get to see what's going on. But it is a fantastic thing to have. Trust me, when you're watching video, it is good to see what they're ringing up, exactly what they see on the register. You will see it on the monitor and match it with the video, let's say if somebody's walking in with a 12 pack of Budweiser and they're ringing up a six pack Budweiser, then you know there is a problem because you see it right on the screen as to what they're ringing up. And if you have scanning system, it's even better because it will show up. But most of the time you will notice that it happens where people ring up manually, means no scanning. So if somebody walks in with a 12 pack of Budweiser, they will ring up whatever the price is, $12.99 or $13.99. And instead, if you see them ringing up $6.99, you know there is a problem. I have caught at least two employees in the last three, four years on checking by checking that video where the item that the customer was buying did not match with the cash register uh, report. So it is a very helpful thing to have. Trust me on that. So contact your vendor I'm sure you have one that works on your register and your pumps or dispensers. Ask them where you can order it and chances are they know exactly what it is and they will order it for you. And it has to be ordered through a vendor that understands the register because not every cable will fit every register. So if you have Ruby, chances are there is a cable that's designed for that register. And then if you have Gilbarco Passport, there is another type of cable that is designed for that type of register. So it is important to order it through a vendor that understands what it is. Next email came from Joyti. And she asked how many write-ups she needs to give an employee before she can fire that employee. That is a great question, Joyti. But one thing I want you to understand, labor law, the state level labor law differs state to state, of course. But the federal law is same everywhere. But more importantly, I apply a common sense approach when it comes to disciplining employees. For example, there are some actions that your employee can take and that can cause their job to be terminated immediately. And you don't you do not need to give them any write-ups. For example, you ask one of your employee to go stock the walk-in cooler. And he or she flat out refuses to do so, even though it is in her job duties and responsibilities. You can fire that person on that spot and you will not be in any type of trouble with any labor department because it is a ground of insubordination. That is a ground for immediate termination. Then, for example, your employee shows up drunk at work or under influence of some sort. And if you sense that he or she is drunk, you can terminate them immediately. So there are grounds where you can terminate them right away. And then there are issues where you have to give them write-ups and warnings. So how many write-ups to give before firing somebody? I would say generally three. But again, you may not have all three documented and have them sign all of those documents because sometimes the employee will refuse to sign a document but make sure to document those events and even though they do not sign it or let's say you gave them a verbal warning just document that verbal warning once let's say they have done something that they shouldn't have and you call them into your office and you explain to them and you gave the, give them a warning once they leave write it down in a piece of paper if you have a format or form where it says disciplinary action for employees, fill that out and in that paper mention that you gave them a verbal warning. That can count as a write-up as well. Now, if somebody is a repeat offender, means they're doing the same discipline, I mean, same action, they're taking the same mistakes or 
whatever they're doing over and over, then you don't have to wait for the third one. You can give them a third bar verbal warning. They don't shape up. You ship them out. Means you fire them. But make sure you document all of these. So anytime the state labor board comes to you, provide them with all those documents. But make sure I believe there is always a time frame of like seven days to respond. So once you get a notice, reply right away. That way you will be in the clear. It's the time to recommend a book. Now, today's book that I want to recommend is written by Don Norman. And this book is called The Design of Everyday Things. This book won't help you sell more beer or cigarettes, but it will open your mind and have you think differently about the things we sell every day in our store. And you may understand why they are the way they are. Sounds confusing? Well, read the book and you will understand. Now, hope you enjoyed today's episode and hope I was able to provide some value for your time. If you'd like me to address any topic that I haven't addressed, please let me know and I'll address them in future episodes. As a quick reminder about my podcast, anything I mention that you think is worth taking notes, don't worry. You can go to my blog at gasstationbusiness101.com and then go to podcast and look at the show notes the book i mention every time you will see a link of that book and along with any other things that i mentioned there will be a link for that and every episode will be followed by a blog post so in case you want to refer back to anything i mentioned just go read that blog post that corresponds to that podcast episode Thank you again for listening to my show. Take good care of yourself. I will see you next week. This has been the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast with your host, Shabir Hossein. This podcast was brought to you by CSB Academy Publishing Company. Be sure to join us next time as we share with you the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money.